Hey everybody, what is going on? Welcome to the GMI Rocket Show. Today's episode number 48. And we have an awesome and amazing special guest, um, immigration attorney, immigration tech entrepreneur, social media influencer, although I don't know if he's ever been called that or I don't know how he feels about it, but I will say it. Um, Greg Siskin, who a lot of people know, have worked with, have seen on many, many panels. Um, Greg is an experienced attorney and the founding one of the founding partners of Siskin Susser, which is an immigration law firm, but also has been in the tech space on the immigration side for many, many years. Most recently, um, his team spun out a, a company called VisaLaw.ai, which builds a lot of different cool tools for immigration attorneys to automate um, all sorts of different processes, which we will get into. Um, I'm really excited, and in a way, this conversation can go in a lot of different directions uh, because. On the one hand, Greg is incredibly tech savvy, which is really gonna be the focus of our conversation. On the other hand, Greg is one of the main kind of influencers on Twitter, on social media, um, in general around immigration. And that's a whole nother conversation of how do you get to be in a place where so many people follow you um, around your particular topic and your particular area of expertise. Um, so without further ado, Greg, thank you so much for, for being here. I appreciate your time and I will try to squeeze this conversation in an hour, but I su suspect that we can probably go for longer. But in any case, happy Friday and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, likewise. Um, for folks watching, I just want a quick shout out to people who are watching. Please tell us uh, who you are, where you're based, um, maybe where you work. And of course, along the way, please ask Greg questions or myself or just chime into the conversation. You know, part of the fun of doing this live and you watching it live rather than a recording is to sort of be part of the conversation. So um, please do, please do tell us where you're calling in from or watching from. Um, so yeah, Greg, thanks, thanks again for uh, for being here. You know, it's it's interesting. I posted about this the other day, yesterday, I guess, just to share kind of what we were doing. Um, that we're doing this conversation. And I wrote a really long post and I ended up deleting it. But the portion that I the portion that I kept was. Um, that I really kind of honed in on initially that was longer was how we met, which was when I was a f just started my career as a lawyer um, and I was living down in DC. You were there for an event with Hyas. Um, I, I did mention that part and uh, you were there. You were, I, I think at the time you were a board member. At, are you still a board member at, at Hyas? I am not, but my okay. daughter keeps me informed because she actually works for Highest now. Oh, there you go. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so, and you know, I, I had interned for Highest multiple times in New York and Israel. My family was relocated and resettled in the US through Highest. So, you know, it was a great conversation. You were incredibly nice. And I was just like this 20, whatever, four year old or something. And you were very generous with your time. So, it's just crazy for me and cool for me to think that you were genuinely one of the first people I met sort of as an attorney, you know, through in this journey of networking, I suppose. It's been a long um, time. I, yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a long time. You're probably one of the people I've known the longest in the industry, other than like people I interned for. So it's been super cool to watch your firm grow and to, you know, as I've been getting really involved in technology to see A, what you've done, and then of course B where you came from and all the history. So I'm excited to dig into all of that. Um, but before we do, you know, I always love to sort of, I think the the beauty for me is learning about people's stories. I mean, I'm sure we can talk about immigration tech on any industry panel, um, but I think for me, what's really interesting is sort of why you do this, why you got into it, and what's so exciting to you about technology. Um, you, so you're you're based in, in um, uh, Tennessee, and to me, that's always really interesting too. Um, how did your family end up there? Like, what's the story of how you ended up in Tennessee? Well, I will tell you that Tennessee actually factors into how I got into legal tech, and I'll explain in a second. But um, I'm actually a Kentucky native and grew up in Miami. Uh, wow. So I kind of have returned to my uh, origins. Um, now, my, uh, my parents were my, we're northeasterners. My uh, my my mom was from uh, Westchester County, around the corner from you. Uh, my dad was from Union County, New Jersey. Uh, anyway, they met at University of Kentucky, uh, and of course, you know all the people from New York, New Jersey that go to a school like University of Kentucky become friends, uh, and in this case, spouses, uh, and they uh, they ended up in Louisville um, and. Uh, 
after when I was still a little kid, they moved to, uh, my dad took a job in Washington. Then he went to, as all New York Jews uh, dream about, they ended up in the South Florida. Uh, and that's where I grew up. Um, but I, uh, I was ready to get out of there when I was, uh, when I was growing up. So I ended up back uh, in Nashville for college. Uh, and then um, decided to uh, branch out a bit. And I went to Chicago for law school. Uh, and then uh, got uh, being growing up in Miami and going to college in Tennessee, I realized it was super cold uh, mm-hmm. and I wanted to retreat. So I went back to back to Nashville, uh, started work with a big law firm, hated it, loved the law firm, hated the work. Right. Uh, and then um, and then started my practice. And that's how uh, that, that's how I ended up back in Tennessee. Um but I, the immigration part of it kind of came when I was, was at that, very early when I was at that large law firm uh, and I wanted to do immigration work, um, but it wasn't going to happen at that large law firm. They made that very clear that, that's, that as long as I build my 2,000 hours of corporate work, I could do whatever I wanted on the side uh, on there. So I wanted to go out and do uh, immigration and um you know, an immigration case just kind of like accident. I didn't just sort of want to do immigration because I didn't even teach at the University of Chicago. I went to law school. Um, ironically, my administrative law professor is Cass Sunstein, and who's in the Biden administration, who's in charge of uh, immigration regulate the whole regulatory environment right now. And he never did immigration law or anything like that part of this job. So uh, we both kind of uh, and he he talked me into actually being an environmental lawyer, which is what yeah. I was in corporate and environmental law at the beginning of my practice. That factors in a second to why I'm an immigration lawyer, also environmental law in a kind of a funny way. But I, um, the, anyway, the, uh, when, I was, uh, when, when I was at this firm, uh, an immigration case kind of, um, you know, came in the door. Uh, they needed an associate to work on it. Uh, I didn't know anything. The partner didn't know anything, but I loved it and decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I had a, uh, I, 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 I had a problem, which was I was in Nashville, which 31 years ago was, wasn't like a hillbilly town, but it wasn't that far removed from it. Uh, and I didn't see a very easy way to develop an immigration practice locally. Uh, now the city's changed a whole lot over the last couple of decades, and it's actually a very, you know, sophisticated market right now, uh, and a great place to uh, develop immigration law clients. Um, but I knew immigration law was federal, um, so if I could figure out how to get matters from out of town, that would be great. Uh, and it was all not just federal, but it was all done by mail, mm-hmm. um, and you could. Uh, you, you didn't have to make personal appearances. You could do, you know, everything following that way. So it's like, well, so if I can figure out a way to get clients from out of town, I'll be able to potentially pursue this. Around the same time, this is like the, this was about 1991. Um, the, uh, a friend of mine who, you know, from law school, who knew I was interested in immigration law, he clued me in. He goes, you should check out these thing called these this these uh, these message boards uh, that are uh, called Usenet news groups, and a lot of people don't know what they are now if they're under a certain age or they don't know much about internet history. But these were th- this is the early internet that we're talking about um, Usenet news groups. It was before the web, and it was a uh, and and they had message boards on hundreds of different subjects, including several on immigration law. Well, I didn't even have a computer at this time. Um, and I didn't know anybody, I didn't know anybody had a computer, but I, uh, there, and it, but I went out and I, uh, I, 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 I went out and bought a computer and it was a lot of money. I mean, it was like $2,500 31 wow. years ago to, I, I was a CompuDyne and I got it and, and it's a brand that's not even around anymore. Um, and I got this and, um, it was, uh, and they, it was all, uh, DOS based and it was, you know, and it was, you know, not, not pretty, but I, I, 
these news groups were basically a lot of people trading bad information with each other. There weren't any lawyers that were in this. So it was like, you know, ding, 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 here's an opportunity to put some information out and try and be useful uh, on there. And which, which I was, I mean, I was just basically posting like what was going on in immigration law and all that. And I wasn't um, doing much more than that, but the, and around this time there was this uh, guy that posted an ad for the green card lottery uh, on there, which ended up becoming this whole, legal ethics scandal uh where he ended up getting to um his law license suspended over the over uh, ads that he was spamming on uh usenet news group so it was very non-commercial at the time you weren't supposed to do any of that stuff um but it i was starting to bring in some clients from that just because there was no lawyers that were there and i if you know right place right time um and I think that kind of raised some eyebrows in the, uh, you know, in the conflict, uh, in the conflict sheets that used to go around the law firm where they used to have that little newsletter that went out every day in the law firm. We used to get it delivered to us uh, in each of our offices of all the new matters that came in in the firm. Um, but I started to see some promise there. And then in 1993, um, two things happened for me. One is that the Mosaic web browser um, mm -hmm. came out and there had been some, uh, and I saw a New York Times story on it. And there were, it was a story was about how the Vatican and Graceland in Memphis, where I wasn't living at the time, I live in Memphis now, but at the time I was living in Nashville, had, were two very early adapters of websites. Um, and that it was up until that point, it was mostly like the tech community and universities right. that were using uh, the World Wide Web, but they saw some, you know, these two um, very different uh, uh, organizations um, saw some promise there. And I said, well, that's very interesting. But what really caught my attention was they said it, the, web, the web was going to be different. Um, it was going to be commercial. Uh, and right. a lot of the rules that uh, apply to uh, email and to uh, Usenet news groups weren't going to apply uh, on there. So you know, light bulbs go off that this might be an opportunity for me uh, to make my big escape uh, from, from big law and, and, and do my immigration law thing. Um, so I reached out to my board of professional responsibility uh, in, you know, up the street uh, in downtown Nashville and told them about my plan. And they were interested because they were starting to hear about this as well and that there were going to be potentially ethics implications. But what... Um, and they, uh, so we mapped out a way that I could ethically uh, put up a, a website. And then the other thing that was going on that year was, um, I don't know if you know your obscure New York, Long, New York City, Long Island history, but there had been a, there had been a lot of headlines in the mid 1980s about medical waste that was washing up on the beaches uh, and this was during the AIDS, uh, the, the AIDS panic, the panic around the country. And um, there had been all of a sudden a lot of lawmaking that happened on medical waste law. Anyway, this law firm I was at in Nashville represented big hospital systems. That's what I was. Uh, so I was doing a lot of corporate work representing doing hospital acquisitions. That's kind of factored in later on my immigration practice as well, because I do a lot of work for hospitals. Um but one of our clients wanted, um, wanted me to do a 50 state survey of all the new medical waste laws that were opening, that were happening around the country that were popping up really quickly and also federal laws too. And there was another lawyer, uh, he and I both got uh, assigned to this and he was a year ahead of me and I'm like a second year lawyer, he's a third year lawyer. Um, he's a very entrepreneurial guy though. So once we we put this report together. He goes, he, he, he goes, I'm going to take this to the next level. So he managed to get two 20 something lawyers, a contract with uh, West publishing, what well, it was called Clark Barb and Callahan, which bought West bought them. Um, but he got a book contract for us to write a book on medical waste law. So we do this and very quickly, um, and this book is like a phenomenal success because nobody has any information on this stuff. And here's all of a sudden this huge 50, 50 state guide to complying with this. 
So uh, David and I get a book royalty that we split for like 90 grand, which was just unbelievable for like, you know, that was almost my entire, my half of it was almost equivalent to my year, sal a year salary for me. So it was like, I have an escape route. Uh, I have an idea and I have money. Uh, so <laughs> I had a, uh, and, and I was also getting engaged at, at this time uh, as well. So in spring of 1994, um, I, oh, I, I got married. Uh, I took a nice uh, six week honeymoon. Uh, I, I launched my solo practice simultaneously with a website, uh, which went up in June, 1994. Um, and that's how, that's how I got it. But the always the funniest part of the story I always tell people is like David, Fre uh, Freeman, the guy I wrote the book with, he took his money and he started a medical waste business, a collection business. Cause he knew all the rules and law regulations, all that. And he grew that into a nine-figure company. Wow! And sold it, and then bought the Nashville Predators hockey team. <laughs> wow! The team in Nashville. So he did a little bit better with his book royalty, but my book royalty, I was able to start the uh, start start what became Siskin Susser. Um, so I uh, that's how I got into uh, in, in, into it, and the web in, in the website. And the internet stuff has been through the whole history of the firm. In fact, the firm was planned around it. Um, so that's how I got into it. And then I, uh, the writing has always been sort of a part of my history on that. And I, in 96, um, I wrote a book uh, called The Lawyer's Guide to Marketing on the Internet for the ABA about that experience and kind of, you know, basically everything I thought about websites at that time. And I kind of told people what I liked, what I didn't like and, and all that. And that, that book did pretty well also, and was ended up going like in four editions. Um, wow. But that was a, uh, that was happening around the same time. Um, but that was, that's sort of the origin story for how the firm started. Lynn Susser, actually, uh, my law partner had been, was, would have joined me at the very beginning, except Lynn was graduating law school in 94. Uh, and she had a business background and I thought it would be, you know, and, and she, I, I knew having somebody with a business background would be really helpful for a solo, uh, you know, having no business background myself. Uh, but my, my father was in marketing. Um, so I, at least I had a lot of good support in that area. And I think that that's always been a, uh, he had a ad, little ad agency in Miami and had a lot of influence to sort of like the way I view the world. So that's, you uh, know. I was going to ask you, you know, what sort of brought your father down to your family down to Miami. So that, that was a, a perfect segue. I'm curious, though. I mean, when you wrote this book with um, Brian, you said his uh, your oh, David Freeman. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, when you when you guys wrote this book, were you still practicing at the at your big law firm at the time? When we wrote the book, we were. David actually right. left before the book came out to start his right. business. Uh, I left very shortly after that i don't think the law firm was too happy about uh about it about that but it was a uh i was told that they kind of changed some changed their policies after i left uh regarding book royalties and 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 such but um you know i mean that uh, to me, you know to me yeah that that's what was it, i was curious about that because my initial thought was wow you were you were working at this firm you guys were on a project for a client that was not your personal client it was the firm's client and then you ended up using a lot of that information to publish a book that i sounds like well the the, the report for the client was you know like 50 pages the book itself right. was like a thousand pages Gotcha. gotcha. They were not. They weren't at all the same thing. And gotcha. the uh, on there, the the that that research project basically gave us the idea for the book. Uh, Got it. On there, but they were yeah. And that research project was done over like about you know two or three weeks. We basically put that thing together. The book itself took you know months and months um, to put that out. But it uh, it and it, it it was actually I, I think the. Um, it, it, at the end of the day, it was pretty good for the firm as well because the client was uh, the book that was produced at the end was a whole lot more useful for the firm's clients than that little project was. So, 
I think they were, but, and I think that at the end of the day, they were you know pretty happy with with how they. Th this was a firm actually. One smart marketing thing that they did was they set up this whole alumni program for lawyers after they left because they started to figure out that a lot of their alumni become in-house counsel and and at the end of the day can refer a lot of work back to them and it's a it's a nice ecosystem so they were they were always pretty nice to me afterwards and i think they were pretty happy with what the way my career uh moved after after that so i i always got uh, uh pretty warm receptions uh, now would you would you say that um would you say that kind of this sounds like it, you, the, the light bulb moment? You, you had this light bulb moment with the internet, you know, learning about well, first learning about these um, the Usenet sort of forums, and then of course this book sounds like it was also an introduction to an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial endeavor. Would you say that sort of earlier on in in life? Because one thing that I read, and I think you I, you even mentioned this on your your LinkedIn profile, you graduated college in two and a half years, or right, you graduated college in two and a half years, right, Vanderbilt. Um, so it sounds like, I mean, my in instinct is to say you were very academic, you were studious, obviously very smart. Did you th think of yourself as an entrepreneur? Did you have sort of business m a mindset or were you always like, I'm going to study, get great grades and sort of follow a more, I should say, traditional path where you kind of go to, you know, a, a more traditional job? Um, I, I did think I was going to be an entrepreneur at the beginning. My father... I think is a very good entrepreneur, um, but it was, you know, entrepreneurs have, have, have ups and downs and it, you know, so there was a lot of financial instability when I was growing up with, uh, with, with, with businesses that uh, did better than others. Um, but when I, you know, so I, I think what I was looking for, that's an interesting question. Um, when I, when I went, you know, it, I was also, there was a maturity thing that was an issue for me as well, because, I finished. I, I finished high school. I, I skipped a grade of high school before I started college, so I'm off. You know, I'm finished with high school. When I'm 16, and I'm done with college when I'm 19, and that's a very young age to be making like long-term decisions on what you're going to do. And I ended up going to law school um, at the time, basically because I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And everybody said, Oh, a law degree, you can use it for a million different things uh, yeah. on there. So when I finished law school, um, I actually didn't even think I wanted to be a lawyer anymore. After that, um, wow. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. But I actually thought I might want to go and get a PhD and do something in academia and become a professor. And that would be kind of a nice, quiet, easy life. And uh, that would be um, that, that would be fine. Uh, on there, and I and I thought I would actually be a history professor, and that uh, that, that was um, until I discovered immigration law and found that there was an area of law that I liked. Um, so law was not supposed to be a long term endeavor. Uh, once I got into it, but I had loans uh, that I had to pay, and um, also the law school I went to, there was sort of a everybody kind of seemed to track into big law, um, and. So it was like, you know, the, uh, that, so my law, my summer associate jobs were in big law firms. Right. Uh, all my friends were going to big law firms. I ended up going back to Nashville because I thought if I'm going to get out of, if I'm going to leave uh, law and do something else, at least I should be in a city where I have a lot of friends. And, right. uh, and, and so I, that's why I went back there. But I didn't think the entrepreneurial route was what I wanted to do, but I did want to be an immigration lawyer that I did that when I figured that out, then what ended up, uh, I kind of looked around in Nashville, uh, and there were like a handful of other immigration lawyers. So I reached out and I couldn't, I couldn't find a, uh, either something that I liked or somebody that wanted to hire me. Uh, so then I was looking in, um, Atlanta and DC and Seattle and in Portland and, and some of the lawyers that interviewed me over the years are still in practice and know that, know, know that I, uh, I could have worked for them. Um, but I was getting serious with my, uh, girlfriend, now wife, uh, of many years. And she made it very clear that she wasn't moving. So she said that, uh, you can do your own thing here and I will support you if you want to, if you want to open up your own practice and I don't care if we're poor for a while. Um, but 
you can, uh, but I'm not moving with you. So I'm not doing a long distance relationship. And if you want to move, then you can move, but it's the end of our, it's the end of us on there. Sorry. I don't want it to be the end of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that kind of also was a, uh, got me thinking, well, maybe, maybe I can pull this off uh, on there. So the internet stuff and the book royalty and my wife's ultimatum uh, all kind of came, you know, made, made it an obvious choice for me. And once I was in it, um, I really liked it. And the other thing that at the time that, um, it's kind of funny because I just tweeted about this yesterday, but there was a book that was uh, by this guy Jay Foonberg, um, who writes this book called "The How to Build and uh, How to Build How to Start and Build a Law pra- a Law Practice." And he writes it for, wrote it for the ABA, and I got this book, which is like the Bible for starting up solo law practices, and it was like very intriguing to me and all that. And then of course I had my dad, who was a, uh, you know, knew all about small business life and gave me a lot of good advice on, on, on what to do, and what not to do. Um, and it turns out that I really did like it. Uh, and it was really, you know, it was kind of like not what I was intending to do all along, but once I got into it, I really liked it. Um, what did your, um, what did your dad do? You said he had a small business. I'm, I'm just curious. Cause you said he was uh, in market. He had an, he, he had an advertising agency. Uh, he, he and his partner uh, in Miami over the years. He had um, he actually um, he was I was the third generation to go to law school, the first to actually practice law. Uh, oh. My grandfather during the, went to law school. Then the depression hit uh, while he was in law school, and he dropped out. My dad went to law school uh, and then uh decided he didn't like it he dropped out (laughs) so uh i was third generation to go and the first to uh finish although my sister and i started and ended law school the same week uh she uh she so she's she's been practicing all these years as well so both of us have been lawyers the same amount of time uh on there and she's an entrepreneur too she started as a so she's she's the uh senior partner and uh her firm is actually i think has like 26 lawyers it's a uh it's a, she, she's, she's very, uh, I, I pick up a lot of really good advice from her as well. Um, and hopefully vice versa. So I want to, I want to jump into just a few comments from folks. I just want to show them here. Shiv says, hi, Roman and Greg. Hey, Shiv, thank you so much for, for watching. Um, Elena says, greetings, Roman and Greg, greetings back to you. Um, poor V looking forward to the discussion. And Greg hey, is a good v. friend for a lawyer <laughs> tech quiz from Mumbai currently in Florida. Thank you, Porvi, for the comment, for watching. Uh, Marianne says, total fan. <laughs> this is very exciting to see you both here together. Happy Friday. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Marco, Marco says, hi, Roman and Greg. Great to see you. Thank you, Marco. Wild, Marco. Karen, Karen Elizabeth <laughs> from Philadelphia, an immigration paralegal, recently hired by Fragman. Awesome. Congrats on the new job. Thanks for tuning in. Tatia Gordon-Troy says, Greg's the man. Agreed. Yeah. Natasha is like she is. Uh, she, if you want to write a book, yes, she's the, she's that's the one. That's she's right. The, that's right. She is the person you need to talk to about that. And she helped me set up a, a publishing house at our law firm. That's been a, uh, a big, a, a big, a big success for us. That's awesome. Uh, Kratika says hi, Greg and, Gro- and Roman. Good to hear from you. Likewise, and Lou says, hi, Roman and Greg, watching you from San Francisco. Thank you so much for tuning in. So just wanted to give folks a quick shout out and, and say hello. So so I, I kind of want to move ahead a little bit. Um, you know, at this point, it sounds like you've started your firm. You've also you, you've partnered up uh, with Lynn and you're mm-hmm. building out the practice. You have the website, 1994, super early days. Like you're kind of pioneering this, obviously, when ABA and uh, you know, they're interested entities that are, it sounds like are kind of watching to see what happens. They're like, yeah, sure. You go do this. Let's see what issues you run into. And then we'll figure it out as we go. Well, there was, But there was one thing that made a big difference, which was, I was not, some people say, that, uh, you know, and I always have to correct them say, oh, you were the first, first lawyer with the website. I was not, I was the third, but the two firms that preceded me were both very large law firms in Washington, DC, uh, Aaron Fox and Venable. Um, and that's what and the reason why I'm mentioning that is 
large law firms decided they were going to get into website development in a big way from the very beginning of the web. And that changed the whole legal environment because, you know, of course, attorney advertising had, you know, for many, many years, you know, law, they, that it was sort of the, the domain of small law firms and the large law firms steer clear of any kind of advertising and were very conservative uh, at, at a minimum. But uh, happily for me, large law firms decided to dive in uh, on the World Wide Web from the very beginning of it, which changed, I think, the whole attitude of bars uh, to how they were going to regulate websites and be a lot more practical and uh, and friendly to law firms that were going to be doing it because politically, uh, those large law firms have a lot more weight uh, with with the bar organizations. And I think it's okay for me to say that all these years later. Um, but that was that was sort of I felt more comfortable. Um, and less worried about, you know, about that when I saw the other firms that were the initial ones. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's scary to do something for the first time, especially not from a business standpoint, if no one's ever done it, but from a regulatory standpoint, you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to lose your, your license or your business. Yeah. So I mean, there, kinda... were some, there were some weird issues that were coming up, even in my state. My state, for example, said you had to provide a copy of every advertisement to the state bar. You could, and, and it was like, well, I'm changing my website sometimes three or four times a day. Do you want to get copies of that? And we actually, you know, they said, well, no, uh, on there because it was the burden for them as much as for me uh, on there. But there were a lot of rules at the beginning that they had to figure out how they were going to do it. In my case, what we ended up doing was I set up a log on my website to say to show every change that was made to the mm -hmm. website and then i had an email notification go out to the state bar that a change was made on one page which was the log and they can look at it and see what i changed if they cared which they did the other thing was i was always really practical i never really sort of like i mean i never all the things that people get into trouble for are things like making claims about your ability, you know, your success or saying you're the best or this, that, and the other. And I was, my philosophy was put out quality information. Right. Don't, you know, don't, don't try and tout yourself as being better, you know, put, let the information speak for itself. People will perceive you as an expert and then you'll get hired based on your being perceived as an expert as opposed to claims that you're making. So I was always really conservative about the kind of content I put out. That's a really great segue because, um, you know, I think in, was it in 1998 is when you created your, your blog. Um, right. And, you know, to this day, you tweet a lot, you share a lot, you have Facebook lives. And, you know, I talk about marketing a lot on this show and in general, um, because I think it's important, especially for young attorneys, even today, to just create content, to share their, you know, share their expertise, share information. I mean, you know, now there are a lot of people creating content around the web in our industry, but that doesn't mean that all the information's out there. If you focus on a specific, specific case type, inform that particular client demographic about whatever it is that, that you know. So you instinctively sort of knew this. There wasn't this whole digital marketing universe where you could you know, read any number of books about best practices. You, you, you instinctively knew this. What made you feel, because I feel like a lot of people, even now, say, I don't want to share the information. The information is my value and I need to get paid for it. Whereas, you know, from your perspective, sharing from your blog post all the way back from 98, you were like, no, let me give value. Let me give out information. They will come to me. What kind of, I don't know, what allowed you to do that and not feel afraid that someone's either going to take that and copy you or just, you know, take the information and not hire you? You know, I don't know. What do you think it was that sort of allowed you to do that? Well, I mean, again, being in uh, in Nashville um, and being surrounded by all these hospital systems um, that are, it's like a Silicon Valley for healthcare companies. I think a lot of people don't know that about Nashville. It's like 25% of all the privately run hospital beds in the country are controlled by Nashville companies. So wow. I knew, you know, kind of like for me, one of the things I wanted to get into was the physician space because... Uh, I wasn't in California, so I thought that, well, that's going to be more of a challenge getting the, uh, even though the web was bringing me in some some tech clients, I was, you know, not, I, I didn't, I couldn't do sort of the cocktail party marketing that, you know, that in Silicon Valley, I don't actually, they probably never even did that. Um, but I, I didn't have that. 
you know, I didn't have uh, in, you know, some of the bigger markets, just sort of the, you know, the, the industries that were there. Um, so, but in Nashville, we had healthcare and the one thing that was a, uh, that, that occurred to me with doctors, and this I think is a sort of analysis I think a lot of people can do in whatever practice area they're in, it, you know, it, it, it checked a lot of boxes for me, physician immigration. One, uh, it was something that there was a, you know, access to decision makers because of all the people that were in town that were in that space. Two is it's complicated. Uh, you want a practice area that has high barriers to entry uh, on there. So the more complicated, the better uh, on there. If it's super easy, then there's going to be a lot of people that try and do it. And I knew physician immigration. There weren't that many lawyers that were that were doing it. Uh, also, uh, I knew that people could pay the bills. Uh, and I also did my research and figured out that there was a very high percentage of the medical profession are foreign, uh, are, are foreign nationals. Uh, at the time, um, it, it's still this, it's, it's been relatively constant the entire time. It's been about a quarter of all doctors are foreign uh, on there. So I, I knew a lot of this and I was like, well, why aren't that many, there should be a lot more lawyers that are doing this uh, than, there, than there are. And I never really, I think now there's, that people have sort of figured out in the last couple of years and there are a lot more lawyers that are doing it now than there used to be. But that was a, so I decided that's, that's one area I'm going to go after and kind of feeding into this. Um, I didn't have clients though in that space. I wanted to, uh, I did a little bit of that work when I was at the law firm I was at, but it was largely going out of town, even though the clients were in town. Um, and I was trying to like, how do I get this work? Well, you know, I what I knew what worked, which was writing, uh, and I knew that the medical waste book was a big hit. So um, I contacted um, Lexis, uh, actually Matthew Bender. These that was the name of the uh, publisher before Lex, Lexis bought Matthew Bender shortly after the book was published. Mm -hmm. um, but Ma Matthew Bender was a big publishing company, mm -hmm. and Bill Stock who everybody knows Bill Stock, who was an ALA president. And Bill, Bill started as an immigration lawyer around the same time I did. And we were both, you know, just getting started in this. And we both thought, wow, we really want to, this is a really good practice area. And he was a, a friend of, a, a big, became a pretty good friend of mine. Phil, he was in, he's in Philadelphia. Um, so I said, I know how to get a book contract. I've done it before. Uh, I, I kind of lied I didn't do it. David did all the work to get the first one, but I was like, I knew, I knew what he did, uh, on there. Uh, I had, and I had already gotten the ABA book on there. It's like, so I've already done this twice, uh, this process. I know how to actually put a book together. And it's like, if I get this book deal, will you do this book with me? So Bill and I got this contract with Matthew Bender and we were actually kind of struggling to get this manuscript moving along because we just were busy and had a uh, and and uh, and then uh, the publisher like let me help you I'm gonna we're gonna bring a, another author to this who does a lot of writing for us already and that's Stevie L. Lair, uh, who most people know. So Steve was brought in basically to whip us into shape and make sure this project stayed on deadline um, and. So the three of us wrote the J-1 Visa Guidebook that has been published annually since 1997 or 98, it came out. Um, and and I, the, I, I don't mind telling people now, it's like, I didn't have any doctor work when I was writing this book. And this was sort of like, you know, I figured if I told people I wrote the book uh, on the subject, then it was sort of, you know, but I'm like, you know, I'm this 20, at, at this point, I'm still... I'm not even 30 yet. Um, and I'm trying to like hold myself out as like, you know, this, this national expert on physician immigration law. And I thought the book would really be the way to establish the credibility uh, on that. And that was, um, and it, and it worked. Uh, I mean, it, that, uh, that really did put us on the, uh, put my practice on the map as far as physician immigration work goes. Uh, and that has become, that's the, you know, that's a whole department at our law firm and it's the biggest part of our practice uh, on there. But that was, you know, that 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 that, that content marketing, it's you know, it, it the media, the, the media has changed over the years. 
You know, sometimes it was just on a website or blog or social media or video or books or, you know, whatever. Uh, but, you know, it's always been basically the same core principles on content production uh, on there. And it's just a matter of finding the formula that works best in your style that works best. I mean, a lot of people, uh, it's kind of like, usually you don't see the mix where social media, like Twitter and book writing usually go hand in hand as far as because they're, you know, one's very short form, one's very long form. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, if you can find what works for you as far as content production, um, you have a, a ton of choices today uh, that you didn't have before. So for a lot of people, tech uh, is that expert systems are that as far as being able to, uh, it's just another kind of content production that people can do today that allows them to do a lot of the same kind of marketing and, you know, and brand building that they were doing in the old days with articles and books. I love that. And you know, what, what I, what I hope people can pull from that example is that, you know, for people who are, may actually already be experts or perhaps as you were kind of still starting out and figuring out what their expertise should be they're nervous about putting out a linkedin post or an instagram or a twitter twitter a tweet um about a particular topic and you just said let's just you went from zero to 100 you, you basically wrote a book and but what what i i think the the important thing to remember is that you knew there you had some you were not completely uh, a novice you had some uh, area expertise with respect to medical law, whatever it was, through through the waste research that you've done, et cetera. I think the the lesson to me, or one of the lessons, is that by through the process of the writing, right, of the writing of the book, you're doing the research, you're putting it together, you're right, editing. You, learn, you totally learn the subject by writing it. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's that's the, <laughs> that was definitely the case for the J book that I. I would not consider myself really a, 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 a of having the knowledge that I needed to to competently represent doctors before I wrote that book. Right. By the time that thing was finished, though, I, I it was it wasn't just marketing at that point. I really did actually know I know, know the law substantively. I still had a lot to learn from a practical point of view of what you get actually working on cases, but I knew the law inside and out at that point. Exactly. And so I, and I, and I just think that's such a great lesson of like, don't be afraid, just get in, get out there and start writing and start digging into it. Well, that, that's kind of different than like app building. Like I, I'll give you an example of that. Um, last year, it seems like it's years ago when Trump came out with the, uh, the public charge rule, which I, was that the beginning of 2020, beginning of 2020 or 2020? No, or not 2019. 2019. Yeah. 2019. When, tr when that public charge rule came out, um, none of us really knew anything about it because it was a, you know, it was brand new. I mean, you may have like studied the proposed rule and all that, but when it was published, but I wrote, you know, an app that was a public charge advisor that I wanted to be thorough and really, but I was, I, when I was building that, it was like, I'm learning the law, uh, learning this regulation and developing the app basically you know from the notes that i'm taking and all that i'm also figuring out question sets and and the and the, uh, and the, and the uh, ans you know the 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 um, clauses that i'm building out that uh, for the app and all that but i didn't know anything about that subject before the app was done i didn't like learn it and then do the app i was learning the subject by doing the app right uh, on there and that's a uh, that's something that uh, is a I think a very useful exercise for young lawyers who are trying to learn a learn about a, a particular area of law. That's a different learning process for learning it as opposed to just reading about it. Right. Um, you're actually having to apply it by turning you know what you're reading into questions and answers, and 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 actually also having to develop you know um, flow charts and process flows and all of that. Um, I think is a very helpful way to master a subject versus, you know, the way we traditionally do it. So can you, can you talk a little bit about how you initially got into technology? I mean, you clearly always had a knack for it. You were on the web quickly. You were doing, you know, you're creating blogs right away, but that's still different from apps and building sort of tools that you can use. Um, you know, did you start out just by kind of being an early adopter of case management platforms and then eventually building off from there? Sort of what was that, what was that journey for you and how did you get into it? Yeah, I mean, so back in the day, 
Um, well, first off, part of it is I've never considered myself like a programmer or anything like that. But in 1993 and 94, there were no website companies that you could go to. So uh, I just went over to Bookstar. I don't know if you remember that chain. It was, I think, with Barnes & Noble owned them, uh, on there. And I went and found books on HTML because I knew what I wanted to do from a, a the website was not so much a love of technology. It was more of a like a marketing move on here yeah. that this was how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to like build make an immigration practice successful here in Nashville on there. So the only way that was going to happen is if I built that website myself, because there was nobody that you could hire for it. Um, I did actually get a break that a friend of mine started up a web hosting company. Uh, so I actually, my first office I got in his building um, so that I could wire my computer up to uh, his servers. And so I had high speed internet actually, actually back at the beginning when everybody was doing dial up, I had that, mm -hmm. but they didn't build the website for me. They just like hosted it for me at the uh, beginning uh, on there. So I learned HTML, uh, which is not that hard. It's about the right. easiest, you know, it's the easiest computer language that there is super easy. Uh, on there, but it kind of like, you know, got me at least a little bit interested in uh, that kind of thing and got me more interested in technology generally. So um, from a software perspective, you know, the other thing I, there were some other things that uh, early on with the web, like forms, um, they, I remember that used to be, they, the tech was always sort of a practical, was a way that I could solve a practical problem. So the web was a pract you know, solving a practical problem for me, which a uh, marketing problem. But uh, another one was we didn't have an immigration service office in Nashville. Uh, we had a, there was a rule about, uh, and all the forms were paper with USCIS. Mm -hmm. um, you can only get them in Nash in Memphis where the office was three hour drive away. There was some shyster lawyer I don't know if that's a proper term, but there was a lawyer in, in Nashville who I will not name. Uh, people in Nashville will probably you know, know who I am. He's been around a long time. But that was like making other immigration lawyers buy forms from him. He wouldn't just like, he would go to the immigration service office and he would just grab stacks of forms. And then if you needed a copy of a form, it used to be like in other places, people would just let you you know, give you a form if you need it, but he would like charge exorbitant prices and we could get the forms from him. Um, and it was like, but anyway, the, uh, around this time, um, INS said that they would allow forms to be, um, that, that you could photocopy them. That was like a first, uh, on there. And that also, when they, as soon as they said that, um, a light, you know, light bulb went off that I could, if I could figure out a way to put these forms online, then there's like a big traffic uh, magnet for my website, aside from the content that I was doing. This is another kind of content. Mm -hmm. So that's when I had to learn about PDFs uh, mm -hmm. on there, you know, back in the back in the mid nineties or whenever, you know, that, that decision was. And I put up all of the INS forms on the website and you know, along with the memo that USCIS had put out saying you can now use photocopies uh, of this and got tons of traffic from that. This is, by the way, they didn't have, a, INS didn't have a website uh, at this point uh, on there. And they were one of the last big agencies to get a website. And I think that kind of tells you a lot about the next several decades at that agency, uh, USCIS, as far as their uh, use of technology that it's been a disaster for all those years. And when they did put a website up, it was just a biography of the U of the INS commissioner on there. It was the only thing that was on the website on there. It was terrible, but that was, so that got me sort of like, so that was a practical thing I was trying to solve. Um, you know, later on and the blogs were, you know, it was just at that point. Oh, and the blog was also a practical thing. What the, uh, in 98, when I started that, um, I was doing, it was an advocacy move. Um, the H-1B program, there was legislation that was pending in Congress to triple the number of H-1B visas to uh, 195,000 from the 65,000 that we uh, are very familiar with. Um, and 
I had a started an online journal. It's what I called it. There was no blog term. The term blog didn't exist. Um, but I but I basically uh, was using that to keep people apprised of what was happening on Capitol Hill on that particular issue. So it was just basically a content move at that time, and it was only uh, maybe three or four months later. And it, I didn't that, that that the term blog was coined. And it was, you know, they were all pretty similar back in the day. It was basically, I just took FTP, which is file transfer protocol, and uploaded a file, downloaded a file when I wanted to make a change on that. And that was your blog on there. And that's how most of the early blogs, that's basically the same formula. And then a couple of years later, uh, there were um, software companies that created blogging platforms, but the early blogs didn't have any of that, it was just basically people that were just taking little pieces, you know, turning their websites into these uh, on, in these online journals where they were just having date stamps and uh, short posts and that kind of thing uh, on there. But that that was a, uh, you know, again, it, a, a, you know, it's just a practical solution for what I was trying to, uh, what I was trying to accomplish and didn't really think about it as far as doing anything you know, new or innovative. It was the same when I started my newsletter in 94, right after I started a law firm and distributing that by email. Um, that was a first. Uh, and that was also because it was super cheap uh, to send out a newsletter by email versus print and post, you know, I'm paying for stamps and postage on there. So I had a, uh, I had a little email link. I said, if you want to get this, you know, my newsletter, uh, just send me an email. And I, at the beginning, I mean, it was like literally almost like, uh, you know, just pasting in names into the BCC right. and sending it out to them. And then the thing grew massive. I mean, at one point, I think there were like 40,000 people, uh, that wow. were there. And that's how I, that's why I learned about listservs, uh, on there and had to become an, you know, and we used a couple of different ones over the years, uh, on there, but the, uh, that, was the practical answer for using the listers for what this email list has just gotten too big on there to be able to manage on my own. So the, uh, a lot of the tech that I learned was just sort of like how to solve a problem that I was having. Uh, and, you know, eventually uh, you develop a little bit of expertise on that and you know, all of a sudden you're being asked to speak at CLE panels. Um, so that was that. Now the you know the expert system stuff and all that. That was there was sort of a gap of a couple of years in the early two thousands where you know it, where it was not a lot of technology was changing for us. I mean we did new versions of our websites and new versions of blogs and all that. But the uh, you know it wasn't until um, twenty fifteen twenty sixteen that the tech really started to change, and that was uh, when you know, when, when expert systems came along and we, um, you know, and, and that, that I like, the more I learned and, and I also got very fascinated with artificial intelligence and where that was going and could really start to see some major change ways that, uh, law and immigration law, but law in general could really change fairly dramatically with some of the new technology that was coming along. And I wanted to make sure that we were, uh, participating in that in, that's that's what's driven a lot of change for the last couple of years. What I really love about it is that I think it was one of the earlier comments you made. You were like, I was just solving problems. Like you may not at the, you know, looking back on it, it, it might look like you were this sort of tech savvy person, but you were really kind of first and foremost a problem solver. You just knew about more tools than other people did uh, with respect to what the internet's doing, you know, different developments on the internet, different ways of communicating with people via, you know, channels online through the World Wide Web, but realistically, at the very foundation of it, you were solving a problem that you had, which I think is really cool. It's a nice way of looking at it, right? Like, I think a lot of times, especially now that tech is kind of shoved down our throats sometimes in the industry, and maybe I'm part of that problem because I'm always talking about it. But I think the reality is, and I, I hope I, I try to make this clear, don't, as a practitioner, as a law firm, as an organization, don't get tech for tech's sake. Get tech for the sake of it solving a problem for you and making life easier in one way or another. Not to get tech 
just to say that we checked a box on like a corporate deliverable. And then it turns out you're spending your money, you're spending your time on something that isn't helpful. So I like that kind of reminder of the idea that first and foremost, it should be solving a problem. Yes, tech, tech happens to solve a lot of existing problems when it has to do with efficiency or waste or whatnot, but it doesn't always solve problems. So first think it about can, how it can, can, it can sometimes create new problems. Like yeah, absolutely. You know. All the cybersecurity headaches that we have today that give us uh, sleepless right. nights and all that. We didn't have to worry about that 30 years ago. That's right. That's right. Um, I wanted to just a, a couple of quick comments here. Um, so Marco asked, uh, when, when we chatted about my 01, you asked me, what's your secret sauce? So he asks, what's your secret sauce? I want to get back to that question. So table that question, but I wanted to bring it up here because I want to end on that. Um, but we do have a LinkedIn user here. So I, you know, I think it's through a privacy issue. They, I don't know who it is, but get frustrated at the speak of speed of tech development, but not having PDF forms in 1990, that's perspective. I can't imagine practicing without PDFs. I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I had to have a type, I had the, we didn't retire that typewriter for a while because it was a, uh, you know, it was not an, because there were still some forms that even until probably around 2000 or so, you still had to use um, carbon, in in there and we still had to use the typewriter i mean it was just it, it's yeah and, and I would, unfortunately right, the fact that we are still don't have e-filing uh right. and, you know in, in immigration law in 2021 is not you know at peop, i think in in a few years the immigration lawyers in the future are just going to like think that's unimaginable that we were still filing these massive paper paper files you know, I don't practice anymore, but I can't wait for that date myself because I have very visceral memories of running down the street to FedEx and begging them to open back up so I can drop off the like. Oh, yeah. step well, on. If you live in Memphis, you can uh, drop off until one in the morning. Oh, that's amazing. Ours closed at like 730 or whatever it was. <laughs> what happens um, when the Super Hub is here? I also want to mention that um, I interned for a lawyer in Binghamton, New York. I was still in college, but it was 2000 and um, nine and he, and I interned with him for a year and we used I mean there was no semblance of a computer I used the all the I forget which edition of books it was he was a civil lawyer but um, you know all the and we did like the he gave me like the pocket the pocket uh, portion yeah. that goes to the back <laughs> And and I had to sit in front of a typewriter and like you know scroll up to where the, the space was available to type things in. So and that was as late as 2010 when you had Facebook, and LinkedIn, and everything. So you know it's not that long ago that this was a reality for many many practices, and I'm sure it still is. Um, I love Andrew Wilson. Thank you for your comment, hey, Andrew. Andrew. He says you're a part dinosaur and part futurist, which is really funny all wrapped into one. It's an impressive combination. Um, you know, I, and I think one of the things that is truly exciting, and, and this is where I want to get back to Marco's question eventually, is like, how have you seen all this and then continue to stay on top of it? I feel like at some point I'd be like, all right, I'm done. I'm good where I'm at. I'm going to keep things, I'm going to allow things to keep moving forward. I'm going to be comfortable here and then eventually retire. So I, I just, I find, I do agree with him. I find the combination of having seen all this history, but continuing to stay at the leading edge of it is, is really, um, really cool. Um, I, I wanted to, you, you started mentioning expert systems. If we could take just two minutes, because I'd love to dig into that because that starts to get into what is visa law.ai, right? Which is really what's exciting to me and to a lot of other people. Um, you guys were written up recently in I think the Memphis Business Journal, right? So there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of buzz about what you're building and in general about more and better tools for immigration technology. So if you can, you know, you don't have to go too deep into it, but can you just explain very briefly what are expert systems? And then can you explain sort of what is visa law.ai and, and and what are you guys building with it? Sure. Um, so visa law.ai, it's you know, we were, when I was talking before about content, um, I think what uh, we're trying to, you know, distinguish ourselves from other uh, immigration legal tech companies is, is a real focus on um, substantive legal content that is delivered in, in through the software. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about what an expert system is, it's in a lot of respects, especially when, when you refer to it in the AI context, and it's sort of it's not really true AI or as a thinking computer, but what it but what it does is it replicates legal analysis. And the 
software that we are developing is replicating the legal analysis that lawyers undertake uh, in their day-to-day -day practices to hopefully save them time, uh, improve the quality of what they're doing, and uh, hopefully, um, in a lot of cases, uh, and the speed of what they're doing. Um, so there are a lot of different um, apps that we're developing that are sort of like different illustrations of that. Um, you know, one, for example, you just mentioned the public charge uh, advisor, which help, you know, it will, it, you know, it takes you through an interview or you can give your client the, uh, the interview to take, cause we can drive, you know, we can create it in such a way that the client can actually go through the guided interview and the lawyer at the, uh, on the back end, uh, will get the analysis and can decide what to do with it. Um, we did, you know, something for the travel bans, uh, that have come out of travel, you know, where, as one was coming on top of the next on there, where we were able to, uh, have an app that guided uh, people through how that was applicable. So, you know, there are these eligibility advisors that we've been building. We did one for the entrepreneur parole rule. Uh, that was one of the first ones that we did. We did for DACA. We did for even programs that never actually happened. We, had, we when DAPA was uh, was was we were waiting on a Supreme Court decision on that in 2016. We had an app that we were going to release the day the Supreme Court upheld President Obama's legalization program, which of course didn't happen. So the app never got released uh, on there, but those apps are, um, you know, so that's one theme. Uh, some of the apps are uh, document, uh, you know, th that they create documents. Um, so we're doing a lot of federal litigation right now. And a lot of people are following some of these mass litigation cases that uh, our firm is co-counseling with Jeff Joseph's firm and Chuck uh, Cook's firm. Um, so for that, we have, you know, we may be onboarding one of our cases, for example, has 1800 plaintiffs on it, where we're onboarding a ton of people. We need to get engagement letters from them. We need to get decorations from them. We're doing it very quickly. We're trying to screen them to figure out if they're eligible to even be in the suit. And we build apps that are that do all of that. That they, uh, you know, that they create an engagement letter for them. They sign it online. They move into uh, a guided que uh, question set, and it builds a decoration for them, which they also can sign online. Um, and they can update us on what's happening on their uh, uh, on their individual case, so we can inform the DOJ lawyers for these, you know, each one of our plaintiffs where they are. Uh, on that, and we created apps for all that using these same, you know, expert system technologies. Uh, on that, so you know, the other thing that we, you know, with with document uh, builders, um, one big big project that's going to be taking up a lot of my time, uh, probably and definitely now is um, a, another book that I've just finished is this uh, cookbook. For the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and uh, so you'll indulge me with a, with a little plug for this. Um, of course. But this, this book just came out last month, and it is a practice and procedures manual, um, which essentially has soup to nuts for the 16 kinds of cases that we have in here. Everything that a lawyer needs, um, practically everything a lawyer needs to be able to do that case. Everything from you know, it starts with an article about the subject, and then it has checklists and questionnaires and flowcharts and uh, and templates of different, you know, all the things that you would need um, to prepare that different kind of case. And one of the things that uh, when I was negotiating with Ayla um, to, to do that book, uh, I had in mind, the book is great, and I think is, you know, I really want to write this book for you. But really what I want to do is turn all of this content into expert systems. So what we're now working on are developing the, you know, like for example, we have the eligible, we have eligibility assessment uh, documents in the, in, in this book that help you help a lawyer figure out the questions asked uh, and, you know, to go through to figure out if a client's eligible for uh, a particular benefit or not. That's a script for basically developing an eligibility advisor app on that. So that is, that's what I've just started working on now. Um, the other thing that we're working on is we are developing 
uh, case management platform um, that will incorporate all this content into the case management system. So all the process steps that we have, we have a, you know, we have a, a, a document for each kind of case that's, you know, of, of all the steps in the case that you need to go through that, that works very nicely in a case management system as far as process steps being defined. The checklist that we have for uh, the, do the documents that you need to get from the clients, the questionnaire form that, you know, that we've developed for each chapter on that can be, you know, all the makings of a portal uh, for collecting client information. Um, we have templates for, uh, for the different uh, government forms in there, basically like, you know, marked up templates that, uh, and then we have annotation documents that show you for each question in the form what the uh, you know how to how to approach that particular question and what and what the government's looking for. So all of that is sort of the layers that we want to put on top of a case management system that will hopefully uh, change the way people think about their case management system as something where they just dump client data and produce forms and keep track of deadlines, which is the main things that people are using uh, case management systems for to something that is more, much more of a tool to help you practice, to actually, actually help you uh, assess your cases and learn about immigration law as you're actually pulling in the, and putting the information in and pulling the documents in to that, to that system. So that's, that's where, you know, that, that's a big project, obviously, for us. Um, we built a consultation bot that is also something now that we've just released. Um, and that's a another thing that I think is you know really going to change uh, the way people think about uh, about how they use technology in their practices. So there are lots of bots that are out there right now that I would say are more kind of in the marketing. And you know, I'm obviously I I, I love marketing and I come from a marketing background, but that's not what this bot that I'm talking about is. But those bots are more about like you know getting a person to the point where they schedule an appointment with a law firm and, uh, and, and deliver new business to a law firm. What we are, uh, have built is, is a tool that um, assesses, uh, the, the, after a client has actually set up the interview, uh, the consultation with you, what we, in most law firms, do some screening uh, before the client actually comes in. They might have a paralegal ask them a bunch of questions. The attorney might be asking a bunch of questions before the person actually comes in. Um, and then, or sometimes lawyers will just have somebody come in, you know, without knowing anything about it. And then we'll spend the first 20 minutes of a consultation, just like, you know, let's, let's get this conversation started. And over the course of the first 20 or 30 minutes, they'll ask all the questions. And then right. the second half of the consultation will be really kind of assessing the options and laying out a strategy. And that's perfectly fine on there. What we wanted to do was to cut out about 20 to 30 minutes out of a typical lawyer consultation and make it more effective. So we have, a, you know, now we're a, a decent sized number of lawyers at the firm and we're full service. So we have, a, you know, employment and family and removal and asylum in the works at our firm. We do most things. Um, and we started having retreats uh, in 2019 to start building out these question sets, basically uh, decision, you know, decision trees where, you know, they ask questions and then you go along certain paths the same way we would in a consultation. If you ask a question and the client answers it in a certain way, that triggers a follow-up question and a follow-up and a follow-up. And it also screens out questions that you're going to ask because uh, they, you know, they say no. So you're not going to, you know, they like you ask them what, about their nationality, and they say no. And, you know, do you have any other passports? No. And then so therefore, you're not going to ask them questions about, you know, uh, more questions about E2 eligibility because they're not eligible for it on there. But that's that's what's going on in our heads when we're doing consultations is we're doing this natural decision trees. And, you know, our, we're, the brain is the computer there. What we are doing in this bot is we're essentially um, conducting that whole interview. Uh, for the benefit of the lawyer before they get in. Now, at the beginning, version one, the lawyer will get a transcript and they can kind of review, you know, review this, uh, review it for five or ten minutes before the client comes in, and then hopefully we'll have a more productive consultation because they will have all the information laid out for them. And it's a much more robust interview than just a little intake form that you might send a client. 
Um, the next version of it, though, is the part that I'm really excited about, which is actually providing the legal analysis to the lawyers to tell them, um, you know, the, here are the red flags, why they don't, you know, the things that you need to ask, you know, to, to focus on that might cause eligibility issues or admissibility issues. Here are the what the bot has identified as the top three or four strategies that you should discuss based on uh, what they answered and then highlight for them what they how they you know why they answered it as far as the different requirements for that particular kind of visa or whatever it is that you're asking about and getting a fairly detailed report for the lawyer on the front end which you know can be a very valuable thing for a new lawyer who you know is getting basically the you know, the ex basically an experienced lawyer that's giving them, you know, an assessment that they can then review when they're talking to the client. Uh, and it also hopefully will prevent malpractice um, by lawyers who, uh, you know, forget to ask a question on something that's pretty important. Like, you know, I always remind people about the shoplifting doctors uh, out there that you have a bias. You just assume your doctor has not, never had a criminal conviction uh, for anything because, they're a doctor on there and you just have your own biases in your head. Lawyers make those assumptions all the time about clients on there. The bots don't make those assumptions on there. So a lot of things that you may forget to ask them about, or you may, you know, we a lot of times forget to ask questions about family members and that maybe they have I-94s that don't expire on the same dates as the person you're talking to. So they have different deadlines, but all the little mistakes that lawyers make because of our own biases and assumptions you can a bot can help you or an expert system can help you uh, with preventing that so that's another example of something we're working on that i'm fairly excited about that i think will change the way lawyers practice and i uh, uh, in, in the way that they view technology as basically helping them uh strategize on their cases and that's something i don't think we see that much of at this point but i think we will in the years to come the website is visabot.ai is that right that one is visalaw.bot. Visalaw.bot, okay. But you can and find so, it at visalaw.ai. Visalaw.ai, right. So visalaw.ai is the main sort of hub for all of your, you know, all of the tools that you're building and the right. technology. And I suppose people can sign up to a mailing list there to kind of stay up to date on yeah. things. Or yeah, Josh Waddell is basically, he's uh, he's one of our, uh, our shareholders in uh, visalaw.ai and he's manages the website and he's keeping track of all of that. But uh yeah, if you go there, you can you should be able to sign up and be on our mailing list. That's awesome. Um, it's really exciting. And I, my one question to you would be sort of, do you think, and maybe this goes towards the question of where you think the industry is going. I mean, in a, in a way, you're building the future of the industry. You're building the tools and and the the, the technologies that lawyers can use moving forward. Um, you know, it's kind of like a calculator right now. They're using the abacus and you're like, look, you know that you get the math conceptually. You don't need to do this complicated division every time. Here's this device, plug the inputs. It'll give you the output. Um, it's not as black and white as a calculator. Obviously, this is more of a sort of a, a first step or a first level legal, legal analysis. The attorney still has to weigh that against other things that might come up during the interview, I suppose. Um, do you think that this is where kind of the industry is going of like, AI or 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 tech based support that sort of can push things forward a little bit more quickly. Do you think there's ever going to be a case where once the bot says yes or no, that's it? You can file based on that rather than having the additional attorney review. I, I mean, I think that a lot of times visionaries in the space they think, look, let's do as much as we can. I'm sure there are some things that we can just build automate completely. Um, do you think that's ever going to happen or like, what are your thoughts on that? I, I don't think in immigration law, we're going to see that because immigration law by its nature, it's the most political, you know, one of the most political yeah. areas of law. It is very much um, still, you know, changing so rapidly and all that, that I think in a lot of cases, the uh, the tech will have trouble keeping up with the, uh, with, with the changes that are coming in. That's so I, I but what I, what I'm envisioning down the road is a practice that um, a lot of the tasks that happen in law firms right now will be automated uh, and that lawyers and paralegals down the road, a lot more of what we are going to be doing is managing technology and managing relationships with people. 
I mean, at the end of the day, we are professional services businesses and we have to have the expertise ourselves. We have to, you know, and, and the, the, our technology is going to be, you know, what may differentiate us from the competition, but essentially people are still going to be hiring the lawyers. They are still going to be expecting their lawyers to be the ones that are holding their hands and, and guiding them through the process. Paralegals are going to be a lot more about relationship management and making sure that, uh, that, that, that our clients are serviced well. Uh, and that's where I, you know, and, and a lot of the stuff that lawyers do right now, like legal research, like, you know, like, like drafting, uh, a lot of those tasks will be um, greatly automated. I don't, you know, we, we, at the end of the day, still will be reviewing the, the work product at the end and making sure that we're happy with it and all that, but we will be able to, uh, you know, a lot of the problems that we see in our current system, access to justice, uh, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, and uh, the, the quality of the, you know, most of us are, cons you know, when we're thinking about the way we practice, we want to put out good work. We want to put it out reasonably and be able to be affordable for people. Uh, and we want to do it quickly and we want to have a life uh, at the end. So um, I think tech can help deliver on all of those uh, so that hopefully, you know, we can work fewer hours. We can have a, uh, a bit, you know, better work product that's out there. We can turn things around more quickly for, you know, for what our clients want and hopefully do it at a price that more people can afford our services. At the end of the day, I, I think we're all, we're going to see a lot more competition as well from non-lawyers. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think there's probably for most people, probably still a preference to use a lawyer uh, for a complicated process. And, um, but if we can't solve the problems that are, you know, the issues I was talking about in terms of speed and price and quality uh, on there, then, I think other, you know, we're going to see non-law entities uh, get into the space and eat our lunch uh, on there, and, uh, and that's and that will be deserved if we don't figure out ways to be able to deliver on those. There's also this idea that um, there's a large unserved market, not an underserved market, but there is just a market that can't afford is not eligible for pro bono services and can't afford traditional legal services, and so yeah. if we can create <laughs> some sort of an augmented service that can really lower the price, continue to deliver high quality, you know, legal or immigration services, then we can actually bring in more people into the sort of legal, you know, non pro se immigration process, give them a better chance at, you know, figuring out their status. Yeah. And there's probably, I mean, I'm excited about some of the stuff that's happening in Utah and some of the Western states, as far as these yeah. new uh, ways to deliver law, where, you know, there are probably hybrid entities where you can have right. lawyers that are, providing some aspects of the service uh, on there and are using uh, technology um, to provide other aspects to it uh, on there. And I've, you know, we're already starting to see some legal tech companies that are, uh, you know, that are, that are having uh, web assisted case, you know, case management as far as, you know, produce, producing uh, applications uh, and then, screen out and be you know can, can shuffle cases off to lawyers when uh you know the the ai says that uh they you know this person has more complicated issues and uh and, and needs extra review on there and then that, that's that's that we're already that's today that's not the future uh, on there there are some good products that are already doing that out there today and i i think we're going to see more of that and i think some of that we're going to be seeing law, lawyers actually uh, deploying those kinds of technology as opposed to, uh, you know, the uh, non-lawyers that are doing that on their own. I think law, that that's going to be something that's going to be um, a lot more common within the bar uh, once people can kind of get over the idea of not necessarily being able to ma you know, ma micromanage every matter that comes in. Just a quick note here, Shiv says, a quick, quick plug, um, a review. Uh, bot review of an immigration filing can be used for quality control purposes. And and I definitely agree with that, um, which I think kind of leads to what you're saying. It might be, it might not be that the bot or the tech is giving the final review, but it might be either on the front end or the back end, a double check. Um, I have two more questions for you. 
Um, and thank you. You know, this has been so awesome. And again, I know we can probably spend another hour, but want to be conscious, of course, of your time and and everyone else's. So one question for you is kind of based on this idea that I started this show and I started in really my interest in interviewing you and so many others is because when I was building my immigration tech company, I had really no one to look to. I didn't have sort of precedent, much precedent outside of the company existed. I know it exists. I don't know the story behind it. I don't know how they got there, et cetera. So for me, this was a way of saying, look, let's get the stories of people who are building all this really cool and useful and forward thinking technology in our industry together so that maybe the next crop of innovative lawyers who either want to build something or otherwise be part of the tech you know, boom that immigration is seeing can, can have a place to go and learn. Um, I think though one of the best ways we learn is through sort of f hearing other people's challenges and what how they overcame them. So I'm curious, and I mean, it sounds like you went. I mean, think about it. You published the book and your first job, and it it did great, and you you know you got the you got the royalties, and you launched the firm, and you know can, can you share some, especially when it came to time to build technology, but perhaps in any point of your sort of journey so far, have you had any sort of like real challenges that you had to overcome, maybe that you thought this is, you know, you spent all this money and then the thing didn't work or like, man, our law firm is going to shut down or I don't know, what are some of those things maybe, or at least one thing that you can share that, and kind of either what you learned from it or how you got out of it? Um, yeah, I mean, we've made plenty of mistakes over the years, so it's not, uh, and I would definitely say that uh, it hasn't been, a, you know, a smooth, uh, you know, smashing success every bit of the way from the beginning. Um you know, we were like any small business at the beginning on there where, uh, and and I should say, you know, the money that I got from that book royalty was enough to keep me going for a while. Um, and my wife uh, had a social worker uh, salary. So it's not, you know, we didn't have a second income. Uh, it was pretty much all, I mean, I shouldn't say that, but it was pitiful what, what social workers are paid uh, on there. But it was a... Uh, so, you know, it was a, it was definitely um, at the beginning of when I left the firm that I left, I made the decision to not try and take any work with me uh, on there. So when I opened up the firm, it was completely starting from scratch as far as clients goes. Uh, a lot of times I violated Jay Foonberg's uh, uh, advice in his book uh, that I mentioned earlier about starting a practice where he was like, he says, should you acquire a partner early on? And it was like, no, you shouldn't. Basically, you'll sink twice as fast on there if you have two two people coming in. Neither one of them have clients that are trying to start from the beginning. Um, but Lynn and I, uh, we 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 decided not to pay attention to that, and uh, so our overhead was higher at the beginning uh, because there were two of us. Neither one of us who, who you know happened to have uh, have have have. And, you know, a, a large capital supply at the time. So the first several years, I mean, they they were a struggle uh, financially. And that's uh, now I will say that um, Jay in his book gave very astute advice, which he said it takes five years uh, on there. And so, I mean, a lot of times when you are going through difficulties, if you read up a lot and you talk to a lot of people who are going through uh, the same process as you, especially in startup world, um, that you, uh, that, that, that you figure out that you don't need to panic. You just need to keep your head down and stick to the plan. Uh, and that, that is one thing that I think has, has, you know, the secret sauce that Marco was talking about before. I mean, in a lot of cases was, um, just continue, uh, on, you know, if, if, if to, to stick to the plan, even if it doesn't seem like it's working uh, on there, if everything that makes sense in the plan and you've looked at all the variables and it doesn't make sense that it's not a huge smashing success on there. In a lot of cases, it's just it needs more time uh, on there. And that is that's what I you know came to you know understand over time, which is that things build on every you know success builds on success failure you learn from it uh and but you can continue you know building and building and building and it's if you're looking at things like i don't need for this to be a huge success 
in you know the first couple of years on there, I'm looking at 10 years, I'm looking at 15 years. Now, unlike startup, we do a lot of work for startups. Uh, Jason saw startup from, we actually wrote a book uh, two years ago for uh, yep. about immigration for startups. So they're on a, you know, they, 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 their view of the world is a little bit different because they have a very short timeline in which they have to be able to produce because they are all about rapid growth, acquiring outside capital and exiting. And there's a whole formula that these, that these startups go through. But what I was looking at is like, this is my life, my career. I'm taking this all the way through the end. Uh, and, you know, so that from, if you, if you can play the long game, then it doesn't really matter as much you know whether you can mark you know out as long as the trend is going in the right direction and every every year in the history of the firm it's pretty much there have been a, a couple of minor exceptions to it the numbers were improving a little bit a little bit a little bit and uh to the point and then in more recent years it's been sort of accelerated uh on there but that that so it, it, you could look at those early years as being struggle and failure and all that, but I mean basically, or you could look at it as like you paid your dues and those were the dues and they were the struggle and uh, we made it through that. But I, you know, I there 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 was a I mean there was like we had an unsuccessful merger uh, about fourteen years ago uh, on there and that was a rocky time for us when we had to, you know, undo, uh, what we had done, uh, on there. And we were all friends and had, it, it was painful to admit that this business, that this merger was a bad idea and we ended up separating and that, uh, and everybody did fine after that, but it was, uh, it almost destroyed the firm, uh, on there. I will say that. I mean, we looked at potentially just, moving our practice into a bigger firm or, you know, basically just so we were sort of sick of the, uh, of, of the whole thing at that point. It was like, uh, on there, fortunately, uh, we, uh, Lynn and I just, you know, put our heads down and decided to get back on to, uh, the path that we had been on and, 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 and made it, and, and made it continue. Um, the other thing that, uh, some people don't know, um, that, uh, Lynn and I are actually sort of relatives. Um, Lynn's husband and my wife uh, are, are related, and actually, her husband and my wife and my father-in-law are first cousins. So, when we started the firm out, we also knew we had to make it six. We we could not let it bust up because it would have all these wider repercussions across the family. Uh, mm -hmm. if we didn't. And so, so that's one secret of family businesses. Um, our firm is a lot bigger than a family business now uh, on there. There's 50, you know, it's 50, 50 is our headcount right now at the firm. But uh, it did make us sort of like, I think when others might have walked away or pursued other opportunities and all that, we knew that that had, that that was going to have a much broader implications than just for ourselves. So sometimes that's also going on where there are, you know, other considerations that keep you going. Um, and that did for us uh, on there. And I mean, frankly, I'm like, you know, thankful that, uh, that we had a lot of supportive family uh, at the beginning who, you know, in a lot of cases, when you start a business, uh, if you don't have a broad support network of people that are rooting for you, it makes it a lot harder uh, for, it to, for it to be successful. So uh, I'm a big fan of family businesses um, and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully a lot of them will transition into a way that the fa sometimes family businesses get destroyed because they don't really sort of plan for when they're too big and they're no longer appropriate to be a family business anymore. Right. Uh, and I think we've worked our through that, but that at the beginning, I think, uh, helped us survive some challenges. It's really powerful. I mean, I couldn't agree more having a having a support system is so important. Um, and I really, I just, I want to go back to your first point of just longevity and and staying the course. And when things feel like they're falling apart or, you know, it sounds like I'm doing all the right things. Why isn't it working? Just keep going. 
Um, so I just, I, I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of times, you know, a lot of people say an overnight success actually took 20 years or, or, or what have you. Um, people don't see that because they didn't know about you when you were struggling, when you were small, you know, when you were just trying to make it, they only know about you. Sometimes, when you're you Sometimes it also seems like a person's really successful because you pro you're projecting success and that's important in terms that's of true too. Is that people have to see you as being successful if they're going to tr trust you to handle their own uh, you know, their own work. But, uh, so, you know, the faking it till you, the fake it till you make it idea, there is some truth to that. Uh, yeah. and you know, that's a, uh, it, 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 you have to, you have to project confidence and you have to, uh, you know, even if, even if you're struggling, uh, on there that you can, a lot of, you know, power through it and you project, uh, you know, you, you project confidence and, and eventually success will come on there but there i think some people at the you know in the early years just assume that like we were it was easier than it was uh for us but it's you know still not easy but it's a uh once you get past a certain point uh you you you're no longer worried about whether you're going to survive i just want to end here um andrew uh, wilson shared a quote from isaac asimov saying i do not fear computers i fear the lack of them and sort of the idea that immigration attorneys should absolutely not fear um, the lack of, uh, or should fear the lack of IT innovation. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. And and um, Greg, I, I really appreciate your your being here and just sharing all these stories. There's so much to learn here from sort of a growth and marketing perspective, and also from a technology perspective. And seeing how you really started from this idea of building technology to solve problems, and then continuing to stay up on the idea of how do we solve the next problem with the newest thing that's available to us. So I hope that more, uh, you know, I hope that the immigration space continues to move in that direction. And, um, you know, thank you for being one of the people standing no, there. I mean, you're a, uh, <laughs> you're really uh, blazing a path for uh, everybody else. And I, uh, I, I love seeing what you're doing. I love seeing what Labor List is doing. And I appreciate thank this you. podcast and all the stuff that you're doing on, especially on LinkedIn, but in other places as well to, uh, you're like the Johnny Appleseed of uh, legal tech and, and immigration, and it's yeah, much appreciated. I appreciate that. Um, well, so folks can find you on LinkedIn, and uh, for again, for everyone to check out your um, the, your, your tech venture, VisaLaw.ai is where folks can go and then see all the links uh, from there. So, again, Greg, thank you so much. This has been just awesome and a real pleasure. And hopefully, I hopefully I'll get you back on the show and we can dig into your Twitter. Yeah story and, and talk about your theories about marketing because i think there's just a whole trove of information there that we didn't cover but would be a wonderful um episode in its yeah. own so looking forward to that thanks so much thank you all right thank you everybody for everyone who stuck around really appreciate you what an awesome episode i've learned so much and um i think we all probably learned a couple of things uh, about Greg and his practice. And again, seeing someone like, like Greg kind of coming out, uh, at the, you know, where, where the firm is already big and learning about how it was in the early days is always really good, uh, motivation when, you know, you're going through challenges with your tech startup or your, your immigration law practice that keep going, get support from the people that you need. And, um, if you're doing good work and creating value for people, it will, you know, work out in the end. So with that, thank you everyone so much for being here, for your comments, for your questions. Um, see you next week. In the meantime, peace out and stay safe.